At the time my father passed, he was a professor in surgery. Now that fateful night, he threw a clot. In a short time he was dead, but even when the ambulance arrived, there was really nothing in the ambulance. And what he needed was very simple. Things like heparin and things like strong painkillers. And I think for me, that was the first time I started to realize that, you know, healthcare was a system. So what typically happens, though, that is drugs are not stored properly. There's, there's an influx of counterfeit drugs, depending on what you're looking for, anywhere between 10 to 25, 30% of the drugs could be faked. That's what we are trying to solve for, to be the alternative to that chaotic distribution system. Drugstock is a cloud-based pharmaceutical distribution platform. And what we do is we connect manufacturers of um, quality pharmaceutical products to retailers in healthcare, that's healthcare providers, hospitals, and pharmacies. You know, I dropped out of specializing to be an orthopedic surgeon to start this. Even my family thought I was crazy. But um, yeah, I met another crazy guy, Adam Yehia. I met even crazier team members. Just keep going when you see something that is a problem and you, you think, you believe in your heart that you want to do it. And that's what we actually did. Thank you very much for the joining us today. Great to be here. Thank you, David, for having me. Would you like to start off by telling us about yourself? So my name is Chibuzo Apara. Um, I like to call myself a health economist. I, uh, I'm actually a medical doctor who went into finance and uh, management. I uh, graduated just over a decade ago, I think, and uh, actually just under two decades ago worked as a medical doctor for about five years before um, switching my career to go into the world of finance and management and it was primarily because um, at the time I had faced some personal family challenges um, with getting access to pharmaceuticals. Um, we, uh, I lost um, my dad who was a great mentor in my life. Um, due to the fact that um, he couldn't get some medication at the time. And that sort of um, made me become more um, sympathetic uh, in sort of the typical empathic view that doctors have, you know, with the medical field. And I started to pay attention to things like um, waiting times and all, all of that. And yeah. That sort of made me wander into the field of, you know, getting things better, doing management, how do you pay for things, and yeah, that led me down the rabbit hole to where I am. So, guess that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> I learned that you have co-founded Integra Health three years before you started a drug star. How yes. are these two companies related? Please help us to connect the dots. So, Integra Health. Um, from a legal point of view, I'd say Integra Health is right now is just a holding company uh, within Drugstock. But uh, um, at the time, the idea when we started Integra Health was that it would be an integrated healthcare company that would bring together all fields to create innovations in healthcare. Because um, we had come, we had I had met my co-founder um, while he was doing his master's, and I was doing my PhD in Holland. And we had basically put together a series of um, post-it and stickers. We still have them, you know, sticker notes on all the problems with the healthcare system. And we had this idea that we could use tech, you know, bring everything together and use tech to solve them. And um, I think we did one project. And in that project, it sort of became clear again that, you know, pharmaceuticals were a huge challenge. And we dived into solving the pharmaceutical problem, and I guess we never came out of that. But um, yeah, that's the story of Integra Health. It was uh, at the time it was great. At the time we had um, when we started, we had um, all sorts of people in the room. We had tech people, we had health finance people, which was me, health systems people, which was my co-founder. We had some great people. Uh, 
people who worked in operations. And I, at the time, you know, we were just bringing together a brain trust to try and say, you know, how do we crack problems in Nigeria? We're a bunch of returnees to Nigeria and um, from all over to school in different parts of the world. And all of us had backgrounds of course coming out of Nigeria. And we worked out of a room in a hospital. <laughs> it was fun times. Um, yeah, it was great. And uh, I guess it led to the birth of Drugstock. <laughs> yeah, sounds interesting. How do you come up with the business idea for Drugstock? And uh, how do you find the money to start? Did you bootstrap or borrowed money from the families and friends? Or did you have I mean, part-time freelance job in the beginning to support, uh, I mean, operation of the business? So I guess I'll start with the idea. I think the idea came from both of us. Um, my, my business partner and um, co-founder, when he was, his, his family had a hospital and they, he used to, um, at the age of 11, 12, you know, his dad used to make him count drugs and put in patient pill packs, which, you know, was, was a family run hospital. And um, I guess that stuck with him. And, you know, my background of having challenges with the pharmaceutical system. And so when we started Integra, you know, we were doing some management services for a group of primary health care centers. And we realized that, you know, they were also having challenges with procuring pharmaceutical products to the point where at some time you were like, you know, there's no way I would give those drugs that, that, that they were getting to any of my family members. And so that was the driving force to, you know, with, with my trauma on why I left practice, that sort of cleared my mind. That, and I guess both of us just decided, you know, here's something we tackle. We got some Excel sheets together at the time, tried to get pharmaceutical products directly from manufacturers, ran into all the gamut of challenges, created a system, a tech system, you know, to sort of leverage all the orders from lots of facilities and and then get the orders to the manufacturers. Um, it didn't work out as we planned, but then it led to our company. Um, I mean, in terms of how we raise money, I'd say it was a combination of everything. Definitely, we put in our personal cash. All the money, of course, we made from Integra went into drug stock. Um, we put in a lot of our personal cash, took loans from family and friends. I mean, we did everything. Um, I remember um, <laughs> uh, meeting payday used to be a very interesting uh, conversation. It was always, you know, how are we doing? What are we doing this month? And and of course, our businesses were our business drug stock was um, working capital intensive, so it was uh, quite insane. I, I think we um, got degrees in operational finance just by running, you know, you know, like. Just by running the business, we got to understand the true meaning of the words going concern, working capital, receivables. <laughs> Before then, we had no clue what those meant, you know. I mean, we, we knew about what they meant on a textbook, but um, yes. in terms of actually knowing what your receivables mean, you know, you get to understand clearly why it's called receivables. <laughs> right. I, I can imagine. But, um, I mean, the, uh, yeah. uh, running how to how to play the martial art in the, uh, based on textbook and then you have to fight uh, so many guys on the street, right? That's a very different experience. Eventually, we, we, um, I think we, we, so we, we, we borrowed money from family, friends, and then got our first angel investment, uh, 2017, I think. Um, um, the first money we borrowed, we lost it all in the in the pilot, <laughs> and uh, pivoted. And the pivot, an angel investor invested in the pivot, and um, that was so great when the, you know, when when that took off. And um, since then, we haven't looked back. Got some angel, um, got some seed investment, um, 2018. So far, I think we've raised uh, just above a million dollars, and um, yeah, it's it's been going great since all these years. Um, expansion has been roughly between 2.5 to 3x per year and yeah it's been an interesting ride <laughs> I, I assume that uh, the launching and the running a startup is challenging job for by anyone i mean who who has a lot of business experience i mean that's challenging jobs so. but uh, looking at the, your profile after you graduate from the school medical school you work for, for ifc as a consultant a few years 
and as you mentioned, you uh, practice as a medical doctor. Then you started all your own venture. Basically, you didn't. I can see that you didn't have a business much business experience or the sales experience working for the other people's company. Were you confident about what you're trying to do at the time, or do you are? I mean, were you not scared of a failure? Did any part of you have a self doubt after you launched business? Just like I mean, a lot of sleepless night. I mean, I w- I'd like to lo- hear the your the candid experience. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the sleepless nights never go away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe now uh, the sleepless nights are not throughout the whole year, but um, you do have sleepless nights uh, sometimes. Those come, and you know, to be honest, I I didn't come from an entrepreneurial family, and I I didn't have an entrepreneurial um, bone. In, in fact, I, I think I'd always I, I'd always thought I was going to become an orthopedic surgeon and run my own practice and that would be the extent of my my entrepreneurial activity but um i think things started changing when um i sort of had that personal family shock and i guess i was convinced that um what do you call it that so in nigeria we don't have our healthcare system is not the greatest in nigeria and we do have a lot of we don't have a lot of physicians compared to say uk or us or even egypt but um one of the other things we also don't have is resources and healthcare systems are incredibly wasteful everywhere and you know going through the system my family was completely healthcare my, my brother is a plastic surgeon my sister is a general physician my mom was a nurse my, my dad was a professor in surgery so very healthcare focused family. And so, I mean, dinner talk for us was this patient, that patient. So it was normal my family to, you know, to go through that, that, that experience. But when, when I lost my dad, it was very, how do I put it? I started to think about healthcare a bit different, you know, started to see that there were so many gaps on the field that needed to sort of be, or I felt at the time that needed to be communicated in a different way, you know? And it led me to say, okay, you know, I'm gonna go study finance and management and come back and work in the field of policy, you know, and fix that. So it was never really, uh, I'm gonna become an entrepreneur. It was more like people don't know what's happening. I mean, I mean, you know, Physicians, you know, God bless our souls, but we do tend to have very tunnel vision. You know, we're very academic. Like, you know, if this is not working, I'm gonna go study how to do it and come back and do it. That's kind of how it trades the thing. And so, you know, I dived right into the field of policy work, worked with the IFC, the World Bank, advising government on how to direct investments in healthcare. But I guess somewhere along the line, I got a bit caught up and realized one day that, you know, I wasn't really cutting it. I needed to get my hands like into the, into what was happening because the, the conversation was becoming a bit too esoteric. And I was debating with a lot of people on things that, you know, I felt very passionate and strong about. And so I just decided one day that, you know, my, at the time my business partner and I had started this entire consulting and we were doing. So I started to get more into operations and you know, when we, when we tackled this, you know, when we had the challenge with pharmaceuticals, we were just like, you know, let's do this. So obviously my lack of business experience hit me in the face after within a year, you know, we, we basically created this platform and, and we were making it work and, and our model was not, we were creating value, but our model was not, you know, properly aligned to what the market wanted. And, and I guess um, once we figured it out, we wrapped up the pilot and, and um, you know, dive straight into operations. I'd say that um, we struggled a bit because my business partner had quite more business operational experience than I did. But what helped us a lot was we had this um, mini MBA thing that we did with the Stanford Business School. And I think that actually also transformed, you know, view on how to run business and all that and that was really helpful at the right time you know we did it and it 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 helped us um you know there's always you you always hear that you know is a decision the right one or not 
um, were lucky enough to rely on some incredible mentors too at that time. And, um, you know, that though they helped us. <laughs> I remember one mentor used to have like this, like, you know, here's what you could never do. You know, she would come in and she'd be like, this is nonsense, this is nonsense, this, try this. If it doesn't work, you know, reiterate, move, and, you know, take a decision and move on, you know? Good decisions are good, bad decisions are bad, but no decision is worse, you know? So <laughs> I guess at the end of the day, we push through and <laughs> yeah. How we survived. <laughs> yeah, so, sounds, great. <laughs> yeah, sounds very familiar. Yeah. <laughs> learning learning your way forward by doing, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm looking at your website now and where you say that we operate an internationally accredited end to end the traceable supply chain, zero tolerance for the take drugs. Please tell me more about that. What are the major problems you have identified in the pharmaceutical supply chain? And how do you want to address this problem with the drug stock? The, the, the biggest challenge with the pharmaceutical industry in you know, Sub-Saharan Africa and mostly Nigeria where, where we are operating is that the, the supply chain is fragmented. And what that means is that you have three big challenges that come out of that. The first is you have the um, intransparent pricing between middleman activities. Now, because everything is fragmented, what happens is the pharmaceutical products don't move in a straight line between the manufacturers and the healthcare facilities down to the patients. You know, there's so many middlemen. And what happens is, you know, pricing then becomes an issue and very difficult to enforce a maximum retail price. And at the same time, it leads to the second challenge, which is um, an influx of counterfeit and substandard medication. So typically, you know, you have some unscrupulous middlemen who insert, you know, fake products or counterfeited products, and these can go anywhere from 10 to 30%, you know. And then, of course, you have the substandard medication, which um, obviously, if you're, 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 you're not transporting the pharmaceutical products the right way, you're storing them the right way, then, you know, they get, they start denaturing, you know. We live in a very human part of the world, and so, these drugs start to denature if you don't store them well at the proper temperatures and humidity. Um, and then, of course, the, the third issue is access. Access is a big one because what happens is that because it's fragmented and you have this huge um, push market based approach, see, for the guy, the middleman, he's to be selling drugs or biscuits. It's just push, you know. And so what happens is that a, a, a medical practitioner or a pharmacist might not really know all the products on the market or which products just came on the market. You know, it's, it's, it's almost word to mouth. And you know, you can't market pharmaceutical products online, right? You can't do it, it's illegal. So what happens is that it's a very fragmented communication system. So um, it's very difficult for, for physicians and, 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 and um, and pharmacists are like to navigate that world of what are the new products, how do I communicate them, what's 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 this extra thing. So at Drugstock, we are a we like to look at ourselves as a cloud-based pharmaceutical distribution platform that connects manufacturers of quality pharmaceutical products directly to hospitals and pharmacies. And hospitals and pharmacies can place orders on our platform and have those products supplied within 24 hours. You know, on our platform, um, our supply chain is ISO certified. So we have an ISO um, 9001, 2000 thing, um, um, certification. We carry out auditory checks on our suppliers and all our products come directly from the manufacturer straight to the, um, to the physician's um, office, warehouse or, or hospital or pharmacy that, 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 that it be. We pride ourselves on, in Lagos, we turn around the, the, the orders within 24 hours. And outside Lagos, we do anywhere from three to five days, depending on the location. A big thing that um, people have responded to has been the ability that for us to give them that insight into what's on the market, you know, what's legit. People don't have to worry about, you know, the product is good quality or not when they deal with us you know that question of quality has completely been raised and we also provide some elements of supply chain financing to help them um, with their their operations 
Um, yeah, we at the end of the day, we see ourselves as that essential um, tool that you know healthcare professionals can use to drive their businesses because you don't want to be worrying about where your the drugs come from when you're a physician or when you're a pharmacist you know you want to spend most of your time doing your practice you don't want to have to think so we bring convenience to them we bring quality and we bring them access and um, the market has responded tremendously well to these offers that, that, that we've provided i see i, I assume that uh, there are similar business model in africa also these days a uh, business model of startup venture is uh, we can see the i mean same or similar business model everywhere and uh, what are the so special unique about your business as compared to your competitor so thank you for that for that question the first thing i'd say is that um in our business the the the, the competitors fall into two to um, fold. You have the you know, people who are doing things the old way and you have the new age companies. Obviously the new age companies, some of them have the same similar business model of course and some of it is different. The old age ones, you know, those are the ones who have challenges with quality and all that and things like that. Um, I'd say the biggest difference between us and the competition is one, we came from the industry. So for us, we were responding to a need, you know, and we are looking at the industry as completely changing the model of how pharmaceuticals are gotten. Most people look at the market as, you know, I'm just going to improve what was there before. But no, we think it's completely, doesn't work for the for, for the industry that we have. See, most um, innovations sort of look at the, sub-Saharan African market as sort of similar to the rest of the world. But no, the, the, the market is not similar. Um, one, because the, 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 the power of, of the individual who decides the signals is not the same as, you know, the other markets. So in our fundamental focus is on our clients. We seek to empower them to help them change the narrative and switch the opportunities and the, the ability for them to, you know, bring this product directly to the patient. We're looking at creating networks around our supply chain that drive, you know, these products right into the media places, reducing access time between the patient and um, um, the, the, the product. Um, we also um, provide a number of services around supply chain financing. We provide, um, we're constantly focused on the, the, the client. We're constantly focused on the, the customer needs. You know, for us, it's very, very, very important that we meet and respond to whatever the client needs because you don't really want the, the client to be bothering about his supply chain um, when he needs to be focused on the patient. And that's, you know, one of the, the, the biggest ways we seek standouts from our competition. Yes, I, I can imagine uh, you have a medical professional background or so you mentioned that uh, all of your family member are from the medical professional, right? I mean, compared to other, you, you know, so what are the problem there in the uh, medical or pharma, uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, supply chain? So that way, I, I believe you can leverage your background, knowledge, experience, uh, uh, differentiate yourselves from others. Uh, tell me about how your company is performing now in terms of sales, the number of clients, or any any I mean a, any criteria you want to share with us. We currently service about a thousand three hundred hospitals and pharmacies um, month in month out. That's one of the largest um, um, in South Southern Africa, not just in Nigeria. Um, we also, um, in the last year, through our partners, we've done somewhere around 8 million prescriptions that our partners have serviced and we've supplied them to service those prescriptions. So it's been, um, you know, a, I mean, it's been a tremendous growth experience for us, you know, um, growing through um, 
the team has has incredibly got has gotten some incredible confidence. You know, the the boost to um, the way they they respond, the market has responded, and and the way you know things uh, have have played out in the last few years have been really great for us. I think we from where we started in 2017, we had um, 20 clients and um, right now we're at 1,500. So for us, that's that's a huge um, leap forward. And we hope to, you know, grow those more, both um, in terms of horizontally and just in depth of, of, of service to them. Yeah, it sounds like a remarkable uh, progress and uh, milestone for your business. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you t- told me a little bit about your fundraising experience, but I mean, if I ask that question again, how did you finance your business and did you ra- raise money from the outside investor? Well, I mean, were they all f- fascinated by your business plan and fundraising pitch? Or did you get a lot of rejection, one rejection after another? How did you deal with that <laughs> tough job? <laughs> well, the first thing I'd say is my business partner and I, Incredibly stubborn. So <laughs> I think um, I must have pitched to everybody. <laughs> so first of all, Nigeria in 2014, 2015, 2016 was not the most favorite or favorable place to raise money. Mm-hmm. Um, so and and we had no background in 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 this field. Yes, I I can um, feel that. <laughs> <laughs> We had no background at all. So even getting into the network was, was quite difficult for us. I, I think the first um, the first um, time that we sort of pitched to anybody that was a venture capital fund was, um, I think we got to CC Hub. Mm-hmm. And um, their the, the fund eventually invested in us, Growth Capital. But I think we, we launched there in 2015 or so. And um, we didn't even know at the time that we launched there that they had a fund, which is so silly. But I think we spoke to the people who were in the acceleration point and, and we never followed up on that conversation. And then a year later, you know, bumped into them and they're like, how are you guys doing? And we're like, hey, we're raising money. And they're like, really? You didn't tell us. And we're like, oh, I thought we told you. Like, no, you didn't tell us. And we pitched to them and, um, you know, from there, it, it sort of snowballed and then, you know, took a lot, took a bit longer than we thought. Um, and eventually we got some um, um, foreign based investors who also in, who were also interested in investing in us. I mean, at the time, I mean, even now, raising capital in Nigeria is very expensive, very difficult. Um, but raising capital, you know, just the, 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 the raising capital into into Nigeria is also quite tough. You know, it's um, it's almost like you know you're you're, you're between a rock and a hard place when you're raising um, um, funding. It, it's 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 an incredibly um, grueling process. You, you, I, I I think at the time it presented maybe to like 50, 60 people before. You know, we presented to someone who um, who um, gave us, you know, the interest that they would um, invest. I, I think at the time that we got the the first wire transfer, we're like, huh, really? Like between speaking to the guy and when when we closed, and you know, it just kept going, and we're like, we didn't really believe it, but because we had gone through so many rejections, but we just had this stubborn streak that, you know, it was going to work out and we were going to make it happen because we just saw the way the market was responding. And I guess at, at that time, we're probably one of the, the earliest healthcare tech enabled businesses to raise funding. But um, um, I think that year, there was a lot of other ones that, that, that raised money. And I think moving on to, through 2019 was a good year too. 2020, of course, COVID hit which, and shook, shook the market a bit, but healthcare businesses were still raising money in Nigeria. I think other, other clients like Ghana, Kenya, were at least two, three, four years ahead of Nigeria in terms of you know the curve. Obviously, Nigeria is a bigger market, but I guess you know Nigeria was just it's just um, it was a bit slower than for, for whatever reason. 
for, for that part of the market to take off. And I think, um, yeah, we, we are in a better place in terms of, you know, the fundraising story and the narrative. But yeah, I think we pitched so many times that you could wake us up middle of the night. I'm not fully awake and I could tell you my pitch, you know, it, it was that, that, that many times that we pitched. Okay. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was the interesting learning. I mean, it, it makes you tougher too, right? Uh, yep. You... Yes. Yes. What is next round fundraising from outside investor? I mean, and uh, what is your sure. elevator, elevator pitch to the investor? <laughs> so we're 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 looking to to raise capital to expand the platform and mm. to improve the. Um, profitability of the, 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 the business moving forward. We look to, right now we service through our partners somewhere around um, 9 million people in coverage and we're looking to take this to 19 million you know, across Nigeria. So I think um, we're currently looking at, we're currently doing a fundraise and, and um, so far so good, we're, we're driving the process. Um, the elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah your, fa- your favorite elevator pitch. Make them excited. Don't, uh, don't, don't, me... don't read the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you put me on the spot, and after all the bragging, I have to make things good. Okay. Um... <laughs> also, That's plus, it. plus, give me. I mean, your exit plan for the investor. I need to recoup my money, right? So, so for, for most of our investors, uh, that's an interesting question you should ask. So most of our investors, um, we're, we're looking for smart money and patient capital. That's the first thing. I mean, in, in, in countries like Nigeria, um, the forecast for Nigeria short term is not so rosy, but long term, it's, it's destined to grow. I mean, our population is looking at almost um, becoming the third largest consumer market in the world by, you know, 2050 or 2060 behind uh, China and India, even so passing the US. Um, I mean, the population, not the purchasing power. And, um, you know, it's a young population. Um, On the average, 70% of the population is below 30. So we still have a lot of um, output in us, you know, for the next few years. So, um, you're, we're looking for patient capital that understands these, um, um, you know, these insights and is, and is able to wait it out. <clears throat> the other thing is, um, in terms of exits, we're looking at two types of, of, of groups. I mean, with the smart money, you have the patient capital who is like in business, sector agnostic, but I'm willing to wait for this to pan out. Um, the other one we're looking for is, um, you know, um, sector sp- specific types of investments, you know, pharmaceutical companies, tech, health technology companies who are looking uh, to enter the market. And, and, and those are the exits that uh, we're looking at. I mean, currently the exits that are happening right now in the Nigeria market for startups are, are typically the second where you have international players looking to um, buy out founders and investors and, and, and take charge. We've had one of the largest exits on the market happened in Nigeria recently during COVID time. I mean, it was financial services, but you know, Stripe just bought somebody out for 200 million, and that's the first um, that's the first um, set of um, um, things that we're going to see a lot more going into the future. So, for us, we're looking at that. Um, you could also look at the stock market type IPO. Um, I mean, in, that has also happened on, on, in the Nigerian startup, so that's also something, although I'd say more likely, you know, looking at the, at the sector-specific player who, who would, um, uh, you know, buy, buy, buy out the investors. So that's what we're, those are the two that we're considering for now, and um, yeah. Sorry to say that, but your elevator let it stop. Don't come over. <laughs> okay, but I, I was joking. I was joking. <laughs> For the elevator, let's let's go. I'll do that at the end. <laughs> yeah, you, you 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 stop intentionally stop the elevator, and you can talk about it. I mean, thirty seconds, thirty minutes, right? 
Okay, yes. Okay, so uh, personally, I don't believe people learn a lot from other people's success of the great, com- I mean, the international company or the great international startup. I believe people can learn much more from other people's failure and mistakes, right? Because the success is, can consist of the, so many factors. Uh, we cannot say that the one or two key success factor contributed to uh, uh, success, right? Also, there is a mechanism of luck and right timing, right place, right? But uh, yeah. failure and lesson, I think, are very, very important for other people so that they can learn from that, right? So what has been the biggest failure or mistake so far, I mean, while the running a startup, and what did you learn from that? So I would say... Two biggest lessons that that I've taken from from the startup. Um, one is, I mean, there are three, but the two biggest ones that I think every founder or aspiring founder should, should should pay attention to. One is understand your cash flow, pay attention to it. And you know, for us, we kind of had already lost money before we even realized we had lost the money. You know. Any proper business person would have told us from day one that, you know, our numbers didn't make sense, but we just plunged ahead and, you know, at the time we're like, yeah, we'll do the books ourselves, can't really hire a finance, can't, don't, can't afford an accountant yet, so we'll do the books ourselves. Very dumb idea, you know, always get an accountant, <laughs> um, especially if you don't have an accounting background. Um, that's the first one. Um, so pay attention to your cash flow. It's very important. Um, I think we lost all the the money we made from from Integra, you know, running the first rollout of drug stuff. And I guess anybody who probably if we were smart, maybe we would have realized we lost the money and maybe not continue. But I guess we we're you know just two stubborn crazy guys and just kept going. Um, and you know, um, turn it around in the second year, and so that was great. Um, but it was a painful lesson, you know, because you could have used the money a bit differently. Just in terms of financial planning, there were a lot of decisions we made at the time that, thinking back, you know, we could have done differently. Um, the second thing is hiring. Um, you need to pay attention to your hiring. Um, it's very in the beginning, you sort of are always, you, you, you think you're constrained. You know, you have an idea, you want to execute, you need that guy, you're going to be like, yeah, I like this guy, I'm vibing with him, his energy is great, let's go, let's do this. Nah, it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, a lot of painful lessons in terms of human resource management. Um, sometimes you, you need to find out if, you and your team member who you're hoping to hire are on the same wavelength, you know, with regards to what they want for themselves and what you want for the company and what they think you want for the company. Um, it's very important. I, 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 I cannot stress it more, you know. I definitely subscribe to the feeling, to the, to the thinking of, you know, you want to align people's work, um, motivation with their personal motivation it's a very tricky and difficult thing to ass- assess because i doubt there's anybody you talk to especially in countries where there's high unemployment that would tell you it's true motivation i mean at the end of the day he wants to pay his bills right so it's difficult for him to tell you you know what his motivation are, but you need to devise ways to get them one of those ways obviously is multiple interviews and and sometimes you know you also want to, um, a lot of our hiring sessions have turned into mentoring sessions, for instance, where we sort of walk people through what they think they want. And we're like, you know, this is what you're saying you want. And this is what you're actually saying that you want. You know, there's a bit of, a lot of people we've turned down from hiring in drug stock has not been a case of, oh, you're not qualified. I don't, I don't really believe too much. I know I'm, I don't really believe too much in you know the the degree you know certification thing. I, I think we are as a society have taken the certification thing, especially I, I know about Nigeria to a very high level where people are all about the certificates and there's a lot of highly educated people without a lot of 
um, you know, practical business experience. But that's not the issue we're dealing with because we don't really care about that. So for us, it's you could be highly educated or just educated decently enough. And for us, we'll take you. You know, it's it's more about um, you know your energy, your your what you think you want to do, and 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 and, and do you really subscribe to the drug stock attitude? Because um, a, a lot of the time, people are not really clear in their minds about what they want to do. And so we we spend a lot of time, you know, when when we're hiring, we we typically so. At the beginning, we, we used to hire in like, you know, you come in, we have an interview, and we draft this question, and we're like, okay, great, let's take you. And, you know, within two months, you find it too motivated staff, you're just going through the motions, it's not really excited about what you're doing, and it used to bother us, and not, not so much, and then after a while, it hit us, you know, when we had some really bad experiences where um, the, the, the team was just not, um gelling well and and you know one or two people just didn't really see things the way the rest of the team was seeing them and i guess that was a reality check for us and um, we sort of um went through this um had to go learn how to hire and um, change our hand so so now we, we take about three months to hire it's a bit long but it's the right amount of time, you know, to not wake up, you know, a year later with a very, you know, terrible experience, both for you as an employer and for the employee who um, you really don't want as an employee, you, 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 you know, those jobs that you're in the job and you're counting down the days to leave the company, not even to leave and go home. It's like, you know, I mean, you're not always going to get somebody who is like, oh my God, I'm super excited. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I mean, if you get that, that's amazing. If you can provide that experience and we strive every day to, to, to be able to create that in, in the office and the workplace and then create that environment that people want to come every day. And, but it's a, it's a group, you're, you're creating a group experience for people, right? This is where people, especially Lagos, this is where people will spend majority of their week time. So you need to pay, you need to be respectful to that process and give it the time it deserves. You can't hire in an hour or hire in 50 minutes or 30 minutes, you know, and, and we learned that with, 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 um, with the experience. Now, now we, we pay a lot of attention to hiring. It's, it's one of the most um, important processes in the organization. And um, it's something we keep uh, emphasizing every day, you know, the morale, the hiring, the, 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 just the paying attention to your team and making sure that that group cohesion is, is, is working, um, uh, you know. And it's not something you do just to say, oh, I'm going to hire, you know, just being anybody on your team. It's, it's really, really important. And, you know, it was a big learning experience for us. Yes. Uh, I hired hundreds of the people who work in many uh, Asian countries but some people I mean they're good at the interview right even though do you ask a lot of difficult questions but some people are good at the interview and the other people are not good at the interview but they actually turn out to be very good uh, employee and colleague at the end of the day right that's uh, yeah. challenging and also is working for my uh, myself i work for the like large banks or global international company all the time but I'm basically large company it's a process driven everybody has a focus on the defined uh, narrowly defined job right but the working for a startup i mean they should be very very flexible and open minded and uh, collaborating with uh, i mean uh, employees within the company outside partner or a buyer and customer all the time so the required the skill set attitude i assume that they are very very different yes yeah Definitely. so what do you have on top of your mind for next step for your company <laughs> uh, um a lot so we intend to um broaden the the, the tech um stock that we're offering and the, the opportunities we offer hospitals and pharmacies. See, we look at this space as um, one of the key bridges 
and key pillars to providing quality care. Um, Nigeria, the, the, the Nigerian and Sub-Saharan African um, space is very interesting. Um, see, a lot of countries went through the traditional, you know, they, 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 they went from, you know, rural markets to some infrastructure, and then those infrastructure built on top of it, and then tech, and then telecommunication, and then tech. I remember in Nigeria, um, before the mobile phone, there was maybe 900 trunk lines for 150 million people. Now, if you had a phone in your, in your 900,000 trunk line, sorry, um, if you had a phone in your house, you were one of the elite few. And um, when the when the SIM cards were introduced, you know, the telecom company that brought the first SIM card, you know, they were selling their SIM cards at something like, um, hmm, let me see, in today's rate, probably something like, um, $30 per, per SIM. Mm -hmm. Now you might think that was expensive, but it was retailing on the street for $300. One SIM card. And they could not, they could not provide enough for their demand. It was crazy. I remember people would line up around blocks to get the SIM card. And I guess that sort of catapulted the, the boom. Everybody all of a sudden saw that, you know, this was an industry that would transform the, 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 the continent and transform the, the, the country. And, and the reason why was simple. We don't have that infrastructure. So for other countries, when you introduce technological advances or things, it's always a, oh, it's nice to have. It's nice to have. Yeah, I have my cable TV, my phone line, my internet line, my fiber cable you know, Wi-Fi, I, I can choose whatever I want. I have my post office, my postal code, I can get letters. For a lot of people in Nigeria, it was the phone or nothing, like the mobile phone or nothing. And that that story is translated across sectors. Now, for the healthcare industry, there's a lot of infrastructure gaps, you know, waiting times in hospitals, ridiculous, health, health education, ridiculous, access to pharmaceuticals, problem. So you have so many infrastructural related problems and tech provides the ability to leapfrog the, these infrastructure problems. So as any, any tech company that, you know, and we are tech enabled business and what we are looking at is how do you bring these services closer to people? How do you bring these services closer to practitioners? How do you make these infrastructure problems disappear not disappear in reality but how do you leapfrog them surpass them such that you can deal with these problems but the, the operators don't have to worry about them and that's the way we think about the the future of tech the the covid um, um 19 um has been a very um, interesting experience in the healthcare sector it's catapulted a lot of services into the forefront brought out a lot of you know challenges with the, with the sector you know if you're providing um, um telemedicine services and and all of a sudden you know people can't have good wi-fi or they're not able to, you know, provide service. And people switch to WhatsApp, you know, very extremely light. And I mean, they, they provide those services anyway. I mean, now with, 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 with the data concerns around WhatsApp, maybe people might think different, but th these, these, these are, I mean, services, services the, 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 at the end of the day, um, what we seek to do is to continue to drive our service with greater penetration. Um, we're looking at bringing more um, 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 access, more products, more um, deeper penetration of our tools. Uh, we have over seven channels of service for our service, and we're hoping to expand to more and increase collaborations across the sector, you know, both with telecommunication companies, insurance companies, all of that.
so many things in your mind. Yes. So, <laughs> sounds sounds like you have a continuous sleepless night. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. We, but it's, it's an exciting 2021 for us. You know, we're very excited about about what 2021 is bringing. We are, yeah. The team is excited too. You know. Yeah, stay positive, and we we can. It's a good opportunity. I mean, the crisis or the COVID-19 situation is a good opportunity. Reimagine and uh, people your business model, and then. Make another great success story for you, right? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much for the joining us today and the sharing the uh, I mean uh, many interesting story. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you talking with you again another day with a more interesting war story and uh, great yeah. success. Great to have to also be on the show, David. Um, excellent. Thank you very much. Always thank you. Good for Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, share with your friends, and drop me a review. Goodbye.